One moment they're here, the next they're gone. I was so depressed after my son was killed that I didn't leave my house for five months. How do you begin to heal your heart? I didn't know a person could hurt this much for this long. It's not supposed to happen to someone so young, someone so loved, but when it does, how do you go on? My brother was only 21 years old and looking forward to finishing college. And the last conversation he had with my parents was, I'll see you in church on Sunday. Well, he never made it to Sunday. Instead, his life was taken by a drunk driver. All I knew is I was still here and I had a lot to live for. Dealing with life after death. That's next on Deborah Duncan. Channel 13 Studios. It's Houston's own Deborah Duncan. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Today's topic is difficult to deal with, but it's important for all of us to know what to do because at some point in our life we'll all be faced with it. Up first, the moment a baby's born, a mother begins to dream of great things for her child. Gail Robertson had no idea how those dreams would be snatched away. I knew after Chris took his first step, he was constantly into something. So I always knew he was going to be someone I would be, it would be hard to keep up with. I knew he was someone who always dreamed about things. He wanted things. And when he turned 15, out of the clear blue sky, he was constantly writing songs. He, papers were everywhere where he was using his notebook notebook paper for school, he was writing songs. And when he uh, finally finished his album, they were going to California to do a uh, video from one of the cuts on the album. And he said, Ma, didn't I tell you? One, one of these days, people are going to sit up and really recognize me, recognize our music, and it's finally happening. And Gail, no parent ever expects to outlive their child. Right. Your son was about to realize some dreams, and he was excited about a CD right. that he had cut, and it was coming out soon, and was making an announcement about that CD. Right. That when my, the night he was killed. And uh, on June 26th of 1997, uh, about 11 o'clock at night, my daughter, they were living in Tulsa, mm -hmm. which is where I'm from originally. Uh, she called me, collect, and we were just talking, and uh, I said, uh, where is your brother? And she said, well, he's in the kitchen somewhere. I said, well, look, call me back. I have to go to work in the morning. Call me back in the morning. Call me at work. And so I went back to sleep, and the phone rang again, and I'm thinking it was like two or three minutes later. And I uh, realized that I happened to glance at the clock, and it was 3 o'clock. And then I answered the phone. The operator was a collect call. And I took the call, and as soon as they connected, I knew something was wrong. My daughter was crying. I heard screaming in the background. And no, it's still hard. It's still hard. And she was, uh, she was saying, Papa, Chris is dead. Chris is dead. And at that moment, I, it didn't really connect what she was saying. And then she was trying to explain, but she was so hysterical, and I realized, you know, it was true and... It's so unbelievable, and I know, because right. I got that same phone call, and it was, you know, your baby brother's dead. Right. Um, and even today, it's so painful because you remember those words. It's like, you know, engraved in your it, mind. Right. Um, and you don't believe it. You still don't believe it until you get there and you see them. Um, for you, how did... Yeah, she was so hysterical, she couldn't explain to you how he died. And well, that's the first question you usually ask is, why, 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 how? How did he die? Uh, my son, he was a musician, and he and his cousin, who was also his best friend, they had, uh, for years, they'd been working on a CD, and it was finally completed. And that night, well... Earlier that day, the posters had come in, and at first they had decided to wait till the next day to hang the posters out to, to announce the release of their new album. But they were so excited. Yeah, and 
that's what my daughter said, you know, so they was just so excited and they said, let's go out tonight. And they had gone in separate cars and then they said, well, to, well, to cover more territory. And they were hanging the posters her, up all over did, town. All over town. Mm-hmm. And they got to one point where they separated and Chris and his girlfriend were in a car and my daughter and her cousin and stepsister, they were in another car. And his friend, had, Chris's cousin, had said that uh, after a while, it was so long, they wondered what had happened to him. And uh, as they, far as police were able to put together when he got out to put up a poster? Apparently, they, uh, Chris was out putting up a poster, and two guys in ski masks came up on them. Uh, one of them yelled, freeze, and they were between his car and the... Chris was between the car and the, the two assailants, so he couldn't get to his car, so he ran. He was shot once in the side, and he kept running. They caught up with him, and there was a struggle, and while he was down, he was shot point blank in the chest. And uh, when it was all said and done, uh, he was, was dead, and they, they took off with they took about off. $3. $3. They didn't even get the car. His girlfriend was in the car. She took off in the car, so basically my son was killed for $3. When a family hears of a death of a loved one, it affects everybody. And your daughter was going to come today. She said, I don't want to talk, right. but, she did, but she I will did. come today. And this was so hard for her that she couldn't even come today. She was really afraid he would ask her questions, and she didn't want to, she didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. She just completely, in she fact, just doesn't want to talk about this at all, but you know she's miserable She still. talks to me, but outside people, she, she feels I'm the only one who understands. Yeah. But outside people, she really doesn't want to talk well, What about. we're going to do is we're going to give you a copy of this show that I okay. hope she watches mm-hmm. because there are a whole lot of people in our audience this morning, you can see the buttons that they're wearing, um, who do understand mm-hmm. firsthand what it's like to lose somebody. And I would encourage her to think of the good times with her brother. Mm-hmm. and not focus on what happened, um, the bad times, because she really is affected by this in many ways. She's distrustful. Right. And she says she, sometimes she doesn't like herself anymore, even though she had nothing to do with it. She says she hates herself sometimes because for some reason they were, he was her best friend. They were best friends. She would listen to him before she would listen to me. And she was living with him at the time. And... It's, to her, it's like he, everything she did, you know, she had to get his approval. He isn't here anymore to get his approval, so mm-hmm. she just... I certainly understand that, but, you know, he's not here in the sense that we see right. people being here. Right. But I encourage her to believe that he is her guardian angel, and she is with her. I still talk to my brother every day. In fact, I was at a stoplight the other day just talking to my brother, and somebody looked over at me, and I thought, oh, okay, um, on the phone. I'm talking on the car phone. That's what, it, you know, and... Oh, and you too, huh? Yeah, yeah, you know, and I really, because I really felt so much much that he was there with me that I actually started having a conversation with him mm-hmm. verbally. And uh, that's a baby picture of my brother there. And mm-hmm. uh, I just remember that he was my best friend because my sister was six years older and refused to play with me. And then my brother came along. It was like, finally, I have someone to play with. And, and um, he was my best friend, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, when, in terms of looking for help, and we'll talk about ways that people can find help Mm -hmm. a little bit later on. There are a lot of organizations out there, Mm -hmm. although they're hard to find when you need them right Right. away. How did you get help in getting through this? In fact, you credit this organization with saving your life. Right. Uh, I remember when I returned from Oklahoma, I was back and forth a lot, and uh, I remember I had a ticket I had to pay, and I called the uh, municipal court, and a man answered the phone, and I told him what had happened, and I was, I will pay the ticket, And he said, uh, you need to call the Compassionate Friends. And uh, he said, they saved my life. And you need to call them. And and so I finally did call them. And I went to a meeting. And I think that's when my journey started to, uh, of healing began. And uh, to this day, no one knows who that man was. Uh, you really? know, I, would, I would ask people, you know, organization, did you know a man who worked at the municipal court? Well, no, no one knew who yeah. it was. So you just said to this day, to this day, no, no one, one knows, knows who he is. And so I just feel he was a guardian angel that yeah. led me. He, they realized where I was. And, if uh, you could say anything to that guardian angel, what would you say? I just want to say thank you, thank you for 
leading me to the compassionate friends because I found someone, a group of people who understand. Yeah. Well, instead of to this day, no one knew who he was. How about until now, no one knew who he was. Okay. We found him. His name is Arthur Williams. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. And Arthur had a vested interest in making sure that you could find help. And we'll take a break. When we come back, we'll find out why. doesn't know if she would have survived the death of her 24-year-old son if it hadn't been for a caring stranger. That stranger was Arthur Weiss, whose kind words for a grieving mother came out of compassion and experience. Twelve years ago, Arthur's daughter died mm -hmm. as well. So you could totally relate to this mother who was on the yes. phone, who poured her heart to you, or out to you. Um, what happened with your daughter? Well, my daughter had uh, one artery in her heart, and you and I have two, but she only had one. And she was uh, given a miracle life-saving operation at uh, seven weeks old. And uh, it worked. She became the darling of the Texas Children's Hospital for four years. And then... In four years, you start to feel very comfortable yes. that this worked for her. She's going to be fine. Yes. Well, her little uh, plastic artery and valve that they gave her didn't grow as she grew. So when... Uh, you know, she was growing and, and getting big and... And they decided, well, we need to go in and, and get her a real artery and a real valve. And so we picked our day. Uh, we had our family there, unlike Gail here. And we had our minister there, everything. And she didn't make it off the table at that time. So, How did this affect you personally? What kinds of emotions did you oh. go through? And Gail, what kind of emotions did you go through? Still going through them. Yeah. Right, uh, I do say that there are better days. <laughs> There's good days and bad days, but... Uh, you do learn to laugh again, and, and you do learn to smile and play golf and work and do those things. But uh, it's tough. Even 12 years later, it's still tough. Yeah. 
And Gail, at one point you, you said, I just don't know if I can go on. What was the bottoming out point for you? I, I don't think it was any really, any really specific time, but I, I know at one time uh, I was walking through my hall and I had his, his poster hanging in the hall and I just walked past it, saw it, and I just dropped to the floor and started crying. And I think that was it. Yeah. And there were days for me where I would do the same thing. You just cry uncontrollably. Right. And you think about them 24 hours a day. You dream about them. Right. And then I realized, you know what? I'm not living. He would want me to live. I was just as good as dead in many ways. Right. Um, for you, what was the point where you got to your lowest? Well, I think the funeral day was the lowest, but there's still things that I can't do. I can't go into the little girl section of a toy store, things like that. Uh, so you find that there's some things that you can do and you can't do. Yeah, so those reminders are all the yeah. way around you. Can't, you know. can't go to the dial section. Yeah, birthdays, holidays, some of the toughest times, the well, anniversaries of yes. their death. I'd miss the prom, you know, I'd miss the sweet 16, I'm going to miss graduation, <laughs> you know, all those things. So, but if I have a... A fine son who I did to go through those experiences with, Dad, I need a car. Yeah. So uh, he's now 19, and he wants to be an actor. So he might be on your show one day. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, tell him to come on down. And, and I need to say, uh, it was a Harris County court that she called, Judge Mark Fury. Hi, Judge. And they're all watching today. So uh, he's a kind, compassionate man, and he wants us to be that way on the phone. And so it does matter who you elect ladies and gentlemen from the dog catcher on up well you know what he insists that when people call they have a human being to talk to that's right mm -hmm. and that you treat people with respect everybody is innocent until proven guilty and uh, that's the way he runs his court and he's very successful at it well you told her about compassionate friends which was your lifeline as well mm -hmm. and what made compassionate friends different from perhaps other church and family groups that you might go because to because they've been through it they know what you're going through. See, when you're going through this, you think you're the only one. And that's right. what I was trying to tell Gail. You think you're the only one going through this. And you say, am I crazy? Am I nuts? Right. Compassionate Friends tells you, no, you're going through the grief process. You, gotta, you have anger. You have this. You have this. And you have this. And you find out you're not the only one. Right. In fact, one of the most comforting things when my brother died uh, were the number of people who came to the door and said, you know, I don't know exactly how you feel, but I can relate. My sister or my mother or my... And in an odd sense, it was comforting because you said, you know, then you know. Then I have an excuse for falling to pieces like this. Mm -hmm. And it is. It is compassion uh, because they understand. Well, I'm glad that we were able... Our producer, Tara, worked very hard to, to make sure she could mm -hmm. find you. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad you two were finally able to meet. And Gail, that you were able to meet one of your guardian angels yes. here. Thank you. It's great. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Well, coming up, for three years, he planned his goodbye, and she knew nothing about it until it was too late. Her story is next.
die in many ways, but perhaps the kind of death that is hardest to understand is suicide. For those left behind, not only is there the emotional pain, but oftentimes there is also a feeling of guilt. What could I have done to stop them? Douglas Bolduck and Judy Murphy both lost loved ones through suicide. A lot of you might recognize Douglas. He is our floor director here on the show. He's been seen several times on the show. Uh, but it just goes to show you that you never know the person you work with, the person you live next door to. All of us uh, at some point have either dealt with death or we're going to deal with death at some point. But suicide, that's one that's, I think, almost even tougher because you think, what could I have done? For you, it came as a surprise because yes. you thought he was getting better. I thought he was getting better. Uh, in fact, I had told a woman where I worked two weeks before he shot himself. We're talking about my your son. Yes, yes, Michael is doing wonderful. He's turned the corner. He's going to be okay. And one of the reasons why he was feeling so jubilant, which we've learned um, from yes. people who have, who have uh, mm -hmm. studied people who commit suicide, um, is that sometimes they are happy because they've made peace with the world. They've decided that I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to end it. I'm going to end the suffering. Yes. Now, he dealt with a number of things. Yes, he had attention deficit disorder. Um, back in the early 60s, they wanted to put him on Ritalin, and it was a brand new drug then. Yeah. And so, you know, that was the big drug culture, the 60s. So the char thought of drugging a child, and they had no studies. We said no. Right. So ADD. that was my... Mm -hmm. He also dealt with... He also um, dealt with depression. manic depression. Right. And, um, and I now know that the more of the things they deal with the more likely that they might one day yeah. take their life. He had a lot against him. You made a discovery mm -hmm. after you died. Yes. That was shocking to you, and you thought, again, if I'd only mm -hmm. looked no. or known, mm -hmm. and therefore there's where that, that guilt comes in. And part of that yes. discovery was a letter, a goodbye note. Goodbye note. On his computer. Written three years ago. And this is just some of what he said here. I shall miss all of you terribly, of course, but I have gone on to bigger and better things and shall wait y'all's arrival with much anticipation. Why am I making peace with this world, this world that I loved and despised, the people I loved and despised, perhaps to make this a good day to die? That had to tear your heart out when you yes, saw Yes, it did. When I found the letters, um, my husband found them on the computer. We looked for goodbye letters. Uh, right after we found him, um, I was obsessed with his last days. What did he do? His bank statement came, and I wanted to call the bank and find out what time yeah. he had done the withdrawal. So anything that anything was connected to that would their connect life. me and to help me to understand. Right. Well, just like you were starting to feel comfortable, even though you knew he had some problems, Douglas, in your case, it was a girlfriend that you were very close to, and you felt, although you knew she had attempted suicide before, yes. had some problems before, you felt comfortable because you thought... Well, I, you know, I, this is very egotistical on my part, but I thought, you know, she had me, and that should be enough. You loved her. Well, I loved her. You felt I, like, I, I, you know, because she felt like she wasn't worthy, and the whole thing is, but you're like, here she, I am, I she, love you. She had a lot of doubts about her own self-worth and and her job situation wasn't what she had wanted but I figured one you know one way or another things were going to change for the better and we that we had each other was enough yeah and she had attempted suicide before but every day you come home and she's alive you're thinking okay exactly it's not going to happen it's another day anymore. you know we, we made it through another one things are going to be good tomorrow you know the sun will come up Things can only get better, is what I thought at the time. Right. But when you went home from work one day... I went to work one day, and she was having kind of a rough morning, but I figured, you know, I'm coming home for lunch. It's a couple of hours. Everything ought to be all right. And when I came home, she had, in the interim, she had killed herself. And uh, it wasn't much of a lunch break. Yeah. I mean, it's... I, I don't know how you can ever be prepared for something like that. And... I just, to this day, I don't understand how anything could be so bad that death would be better. You are what we know as around this, this staff as the eternal optimist. But even at that time, at first, 
there were the feelings of guilt. She killed herself with yeah. your own gun. Well, you, you do. Everyone I've ever talked to has had someone commit suicide that they knew. You go through the same sort of things. First, there's, you know, I didn't do something. I should have done something. I could have done something. I said the wrong thing. I said the right thing. I didn't say enough. You, you go through this whole thing. It was my fault. And in the end, it, it turns out it's not your fault at all. It wasn't you that did it. She is the one who decided that it was time to leave. And the... I mean, I, I went through the part where it was my pistol, but the bottom line on that was she would have found some other way had it not been in the house. Yeah, I mean, she was it, in that much pain. She there wanted to leave so bad, apparently, that she would have found a way one way or another. She had tried before yeah. and had not been successful. And so, I mean, while I'm very, I was very unhappy, I was mad at her for a long time. You go through this point, why did you do that? Why did you leave us yeah. to suffer? Judy, did you yes. feel that way also? Yes. Are you satisfied? I am now in the darkness that you hated so. Yeah. Both of you kind of dealt with this in different ways, and there is no right or wrong way to deal with the death of a loved one. Um, angry, very depressed? Very times. depressed. What was your lowest point? Um, when I had to go back to work. Um, I worked at a church, so I had the Christmas holidays off. And when January rolled around, I had to go to work. And uh, I couldn't function, and my every thought was about Michael and what could I do. I was full of fear that I would find out there was something I could have done or should have done. I was just enveloped with fear. Um, and so um, after about 10 days at work, uh, they gave me a month off. You had to because take that time. I just could not deal with other people. Yeah. I couldn't deal with myself, yeah. so I couldn't deal with other people. And for me, I had to go back to work as soon as I could because mm -hmm. I just had to keep busy. Douglas, you did the same thing. You said something to me in the office the other day, and you said, I, after being angry and after grieving for a little while, you turned around and said, you know what, i got to focus on the good times and it was wonderful to have her in my life I'm happier knowing that I had her in my life if but for a short while relatively speaking than not having her at all well the way, that's I guess the terminal optimist in me is that's the way I look at it is we had that short period but it was so wonderful I the way I see it is I had something most people never have even if it was only for a minimal amount of time and I don't want to look back and think that, you know, here was this horrible event that happened, I look back and think, here was this wonderful time period where, I mean, we lived and we, we, we went on adventures, we had a great life. And, you know, I, in a lot of ways, I'm a lot luckier than most people that I meet. Who never find Who never that, have anything yeah. like that. Yeah. So just to have had that, I was lucky. And Judy, how have you been able to... Well, um, after several months, um, I realized that that shotgun blast didn't just take Michael's life, but it took my life as I knew it, yeah. and the life of our family, and I was an eternal optimist, and all of the things that I would call upon to heal or to get better didn't work, and I couldn't find yeah. And people would come into my office. It's amazing the lives touched by suicide. And a lot of people can't talk about it. And they kept saying, if my brother took his life and my mother never got over it. Yeah. And I remember distinctly saying that day, I love Michael deeply. I'm sorry that's the choice he made, but I choose life. And I will do whatever I have to do to find that again. Yeah. So I began looking, and there were no suicide sharing groups, and I am not a sharing group person, <laughs> but I began looking for sharing groups when you're desperate yeah. and alone. Did you find a group ever? We did. Um, the, a friend of mine who said I had helped her so much from the church, whose son had killed himself five years before, and I don't remember doing anything for her, but being her friend, told me about survivors of suicide and how to get in touch with them. It would have been in the phone book. I just wasn't capable of looking in the right, phone book. Right. And they saved my life. Yeah. And my husband and I go together. It, 
it saved both our lives. Well, thank you, too, for sharing your stories with us this morning. You're welcome. Next, is there ever a right way to say goodbye? Coming up, words of advice from this mother who wishes she could change the final moments her children had with their dying dad. After Deborah Reneker's husband was diagnosed with stomach cancer, he died, and she was left alone to raise their five and two year old sons. He was the picture of health. Absolutely. Your soulmate, and you were looking forward to living the rest of your life with him, a long life. Mm -hmm. That's what we had planned. Yeah. When did you first find out something was wrong? We were in Boston for my stepson's uh, parent. Uh, weekend before he started school at Boston University and we were out to dinner and uh, he said he felt a little nauseous.